The Enlightenment was not the Renaissance, nor was Locke Leibniz, nor is a new Enlightenment the way to crush postmodernism and save civilization. And uh, uh, <coughs> so I pray. I, I I discussed the Peterson and Hicks, and I said, however, their alternative is a reassertion of a modern form of an Enlightenment represented by earlier likes of Francis Bacon, John Locke, and David Hume in philosophy, and Adam Smith to Friedrich von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek in economics, and basic conservatism in politics. This not only will not work, but it will play into the continuation of right versus left control games, liberal versus socialist, which has plagued the Western world since Karl Marx was used as a straw man by the oligarchy to avoid the ongoing debate between the European Renaissance, which was later philosophically represented by William Godfrey Leibniz, Benjamin Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton, and the very founding of the United States, versus the counter-Renaissance known as the Enlightenment. If one does not understand that the Enlightenment is an attack on the concept of man that emerged in the European Renaissance, one cannot understand that the new Renaissance emerging in the new humanist paradigm is neither socialist or capitalist, neither left or right, neither modern or postmodern. Uh, for instance, the spectacular economic growth of China, which in its infancy, which is in its infancy and will only accelerate with the expansion of the Belt and Road Initiative, is a return to the kind of thinking that existed in the European Renaissance, but with Confucian characteristics. It was the Christian missionaries in China in the 17th century who discovered that Confucianism and European Renaissance Christianity were conceptually identical, which led to the rice controversy in the Catholic Church in the early 18th century, and so forth. So, uh, and we go into this, and we, we, this is, this may seem extremely esoteric to the people who are, who are reading it, but if one out of the hundred people that were there who got the leaflet, understands what I'm saying here, we have caused a profound change in the world. Because that's how this thing works. The Enlightenment versus the Renaissance. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment are e enemies of each other. And, but the, the, enlight the Renaissance has been confused with the Enlightenment. So that there is no distinction when there is a very profound distinction. And that non-distinction is at the root of the ability to have right and left and, and, and you know, everything that's happening. Now, uh, so you can read the leaflet, but uh, we got this out. And I'm sure it's going to cause a lot of head scratching among a lot of people, which is basically what we were hoping uh, that it will do. So this is not, this is a very uh, a radical experimental leaflet. And uh, it is also an expression of where our society is going and what our society is. And as uh, an intervention into a conference of basically libertarian youth. So this is, this is an interesting uh, experience. So now in that context, uh, I'm going to do something different tonight. I will start with a brief review of the issue of science and society from two different perspectives. And after which we will, from this standpoint, look at the current situation. One of these perspectives is the Renaissance humanist perspective. The other is from the current oligarchical perspective. These are two different views of the purpose of science, science education, and the role of science in society. So I'll start with the, with the Renaissance concept of science and its role in society. Um, the first person I'll address is someone who uh, is very much un um, underestimated in his role in the Renaissance, uh, the Italian Renaissance. His name is um, Filippo Brunelleschi. And uh, basically, he, he, 
he, he's the one who constructed the dome without having to use a scaffold in, in, in Florence because they didn't have enough wood to do the scaffold in the, in the, in the area. And he used a, uh, a, a catenary, an inverted uh, hanging chain, and the physical principles involved. But he was also the person who developed uh, perspective in art and in engineering and in uh, drawing and in um, and this is what was taken up by all of the artists of the day, which was the use of perspective in, in paintings, which had which was quite revolutionary. Uh, that you could actually present uh, it, it had quite an impact, and his. In Florence, he was extremely active in, in organizing the population, organizing the people in the society to, to have a, 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 a different view of themselves through his science, through science, through his discoveries, through his engineering uh, applications. And he was the basis for, for later uh, people like da Vinci whose drawings and work as an engineer was inc incredibly transformative in, in, uh, in Europe because he's, he designed most of the actual components of, 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 that you would need in an industrial revolution. Uh, most of the technology, all, all the technology, he designed a lot of the design, a lot of the designs. But they never, they never could. Uh, some of them could be used, but but you needed a much more powerful source of, of like steam to be able to, 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 to do it. But his 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 notebooks, his his drawings are, were absolutely um, were some, were were actual descriptions of scientific uh, principles, scientific phenomena, engineering principles, and so forth. And then we come to Leibniz and. He's the one who developed the idea of technology and the relationship of science to society in the sense of the improvements of the physical economy. Um, so uh, he's sort of the father of, 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 of physical economics, uh, essentially. And, and he, his idea was to uh, found academies all over the world scientific academies, and then these academies would essentially uh, make breakthroughs, would study um, every area of knowledge, would, would then use these uh, discoveries to change, to change the lives, improve the lives of the, of the people. And he, he got this academy idea from, partly from the Chinese. Uh, and the idea was, um, was to have a society of scientists, scholars, and engineers, uh, people, uh, and have, and have the, the, the various princes and various governments uh, sponsor these things. So this idea was, uh, now, he was in correspondence with a number of key people, all, he was in correspondence with people all over the world. One of the key people he was in correspondence with was in the New World. His name was Cotton Mather. And Cotton Mather wrote the book on which Benjamin uh, on doing good, which Benjamin Franklin used as the basis for his creating uh, societies for the for the for promoting the good. And uh, so now we come to Benjamin Franklin, and this is where science really takes the science science not as just discoveries, but science in terms of organizing the population around scientific conceptions. Uh, which is going on in Europe, but this is where it really takes a leap. And uh, so, like for instance, he was in correspondence with with people in Europe who were doing scientific experiments. As soon as he discovered one of what experiment they would do, he would replicate it in the United States, and he would where he was, and he would he would he would bring a lot of people in to discuss it. And so he was constantly. Uh, organizing in in the in the colonies for creating uh, societies of ordinary citizens 
who would be assigned every two weeks to give a presentation on something new that has been discovered or something new that, that in agriculture or in engineering or in a, a better way to do this, a better way to do that. And uh, out of this came a network of, 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 of people, it was called the Junto, and out of this developed a network throughout the colonies that became the core leadership in the future, the key organizers of, of the development of the colonies. Uh, he, he developed the whole, out of this he came the fire departments, the first lending libraries, because you know this person had a book, that person had a book, that person had a book, was to bring it all to one place where people could, could take it out and, and, and bring it back and take it out so you could disseminate this knowledge to the general population, not just to, not to the elite, but to the general population to involve increasing numbers of workers, uh, other people, farmers, into actual scientific investigations, scientific discussions, and so forth and so on. So this was his idea of elevating not only the population, but his idea of involving the population increasingly in these discussions. Uh, he, he was a pioneer in the study of electricity. <laughs> he figured out that, that what was going on in the Leiden jars where they're creating the sparks was the same concept of what was happening with lightning. He developed the lightning rod. Uh, he, he, he designed a stove that revolutionized uh, life in the colonies called the Franklin stove. And this was not patented. It was open to everybody. They could have it and so forth. Now, the groundwork for the, the creation of the United States was done in this period when he was a young man and then growing up into, and as he was developing these, these societies in the United States, he was increasingly in correspondence with uh, scientists, uh, men of letters in, in, in France, in England, in Germany, in Russia, in Spain, in Italy. He learned all those languages so he could correspond in those languages. And over time, he began to promote the same kind of uh, idea among those groups that they should uh, do the same thing that, that he was doing in the, in the colonies. And uh, later, um, he went to Europe, he went to Great Britain in, in 17, late 1750s, and he, he, he used these society, this, this, this organizing to, to get the first steam engine uh, developed. And, uh, and then during the Revolutionary War, he was all over Europe organizing the support for the, for the revolution, but the organizing of the support was done through these scientific networks, through these uh, researchers, through these people that were, that were involved in making discoveries in every area. And all of these people were involved in, with him. He was involved with them, they were involved with him, he was actually organizing it. And he was considered to be the, the, the key person organizing all these societies and, and c connecting them up with each other, connecting them up with the colonies. And, uh, and out of that, he organized the, the, the League of Armed Neutrality to, to support the revolution because <coughs> the power that had taken over Great Britain was the power that was going to crush all, crush all of this, was an oligarchical power. And, and so he, he, he saw no other way out in the, for the long-term future of humanity than to see, than to get the revolution, to, 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 than to get these countries to support the revolution. But the whole idea behind supporting the revolution, and later the idea of how, how Hamilton was, that this was needed because you needed to have the, a, a system of government that could create the conditions for scientific education of the population, for not only developing the means to improve the, the, uh, the technology and the science, the scientific, but that needs to be shared in mass with the population. Because in sharing this in mass with the population, you change their fixed view of things. And you create a sense of progress, a sense of progress. And that sense of progress of uh, what could be done in the future is very important.
for developing uh, uh, the identity of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, a self-governing citizen. Right? Because what it, because you actually have a sense that you're part of something, uh, in, in in terms of, of the future, and this is very this is very important, and uh, uh, and the science should be massive, massively shared with the population. Everything that's being done in, in 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 research needs to go out to the population. Everything's being done in. Uh, in, in understanding how to do anything it needs to go needs to be shared in mass with the population, and uh, and this is very important. And from Franklin's time, we have witnessed you know revolutions in science, the industrial revolution, revolutions in economy, and also the the increase in in, 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 in the population that's able to be sustained by all this. So, I'm saying that because something very different has happened in the 20th century. This continued into the 18th, uh, 19th century, but in the 20th century, something very different occurred. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. And now, we need to look at science from the oligarchical perspective. Um, at the beginning of the century, 19, early 1900s, there were two very prominent British individuals who sort of shaped um, the politics around science. Okay? And um, one of them is Bertrand Russell, the other is H.G. Wells. And they were leading intellectuals uh, of their time. And the debate that they had between themselves was this. Okay, if we're going to keep the population in a servile condition, we need to restrict their access to science. Just like if you're going to maintain a slave population in the southern plantation, you, they must not learn how to read. It's absolutely you know, forbidden for them to learn how to read. It, you know, the same thing with this. If you want to maintain your... Uh, your control, you have to restrict and prevent the population from having uh, access to scientific knowledge. That was the issue in the debate. Now, the debate was over how much. Russell's view was that you had to suppress it massively because it, it, it would get out eventually. H.G. Wells' view was, well, no, but you can't do that because you need some of the science to maintain control. Therefore, you need to establish a kind of, 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 of um, you need to hide it. Keep it more or less away from the population, but use it. And they had a big debate over this. This was a big debate over how to deal with science. And this is, uh, now, so that was one, one thing. But before I go further into Russell and, and H.G. Wells, I want to develop some other examples. Uh, when France was in the middle of coming into the French Revolution at, at a certain period, there was a, a change in the French uh, Revolution. There was a, a, it was called the Thermidor. And Carnot became the, essentially the leader. And they were faced with a lot of invasions of a lot of different um, um, invading monarchies. Invading, you know, Germans were there, the you know, Austrian, Austrians were there, everybody was there. And what they did is they, they had this great uh, French engineer uh, Gaspar Mange, and what they did is they took all of these lads who were just peasant, peasant uh, teenagers and put them in these engineering brigades. And these engineering brigades were turning out massive numbers of young engineers 
who, who were just moving direct, and it was done in the context of war, and it's out of this that came the artillery, the superior artillery capability that was developed out of this is what kicked, was what kicked everybody out. Of course, this gave France, you know, a tremendous military advantage, but the idea that you would take a whole bunch of peasant um, kids, kids from, you know, just, just from the average peasantry, and, and transform them into, into engineers overnight in engineering brigades, where you would have you know, one person who's an engineer would be training them in the actual field, and they would be training each other. And they became known as Mons Brigades. And in the 20th century, a person, I don't think he's dead yet, he might be, Friedrich von Hayek. Von Hayek. Huh? He wrote a book called The Counter-Revolution in Science, where he said, the origins of the evils of communism and socialism come from the Mons Brigades. Because it, can, it convinced people that, that you could, that human beings could, could, could solve problems on their own, that government could solve problems, that, that this could be done. And he, he, he says that through that came a whole bunch of French socialists and Marxism eventually, and, and he includes a carry in that group, uh, the American system of economists. But, but this is, this is a, a book he wrote, which is perhaps the most telling book about where he's really coming from, from an oligarchical perspective. But that's just one view of, 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 of the problem of science. Uh, another example of this was the pre-Raphaelite movement, and to some degree in the U.S. the transcendentalists. That industry and science was alienating people from their, from their organic sense of self, from, their, from being close to nature, being uh, united with the small community, um, um, and you know, they lost their connection to their hands, and, 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 and to building things by hand and so on and so forth. And this is the pre-Raphaelite movement, which was very influential in, in, uh, in, in, in Britain. You know, and they romanticized, you know, all of this stuff. They made it into a romantic thing. And, you know, the sensual experience of, of course, they didn't do any physical labor, but that's another story. Another view, before I get into, um, uh, Russell and and, and uh, H. G. Wells was is is contained in uh, Mark Twain's book called Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. It's about an, uh, about a you know a jack of all trades, Connecticut Yankee, you know knows how to work machines, knows how to build machines, machine tool guy. Um, he wakes up in King Arthur's Court. And uh, he proceeds. He proceeds to uh, uh, to take over because he's he, he he remembers that there was an eclipse at a certain time, and he's able to predict the eclipse to the to the court, and he, he ends up being kind of like allowed to do whatever he wants, and so he creates a an army of young teenage peasants who he become engineers, <laughs> and they wipe out kick off the whole group and. and before long, they have trains running. <laughs> this is in Mark Twain's book. Okay, okay. Oh, it's, it's like fictional, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fiction. <laughs> but, but, but he's telling the British, he's telling the, he's telling the British, hey, this is, this is what, this is what, this is what is going to happen to you guys if you don't get smart. If you don't get smart. Okay. And, uh, and the last one I'm going to turn to is actually H.G. Wells's on time machine, oh, yeah. where, where the time machine goes way into the future and, and it comes upon this uh, idyllic, beautiful looking people living in luxury with no aim or purpose, you know, in paradise. And then out from under the, underneath come the Morlocks. <laughs> And they seize these people for food, and the Morlocks are the working class, which have become industrial the industrial revolution, 
and the, and the Eloi were the former aristocrats. That was his um, conception of, of, prior, of science. Science was going to, and engineering was going to create a situation where the elite would become nothing but food for, for the <laughs> <laughs> Now, so now we come back to the debate between Russell and, 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 and so forth. And the debate is about controlling science. And the idea is to restrict it. The issue is how much. And Russell was concerned that you couldn't control it in any kind of form. And Wells says you could. Now, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, is to use science as a form of terror on a population. To use science as a form of terror. And, and Rus Russell develops this in his 1946 Bulletin of Atomic Science uh, article on why he loves nuclear weapons. Because they create a, set, a, a power over people. Threat of annihilation is very useful in creating a terror. Yet at the same time, he creates the ban the bomb movement at the same time that he's, he's in love with nuclear bombs. And this is to control the population to terror. And uh, so they had this idea that the, that the nuclear age was coming very early. Russell and H.G. Wells knew it was coming very early, in the, in the early part of the 1900s. And so their whole idea was, after the war, or in terms of Russell after the war, was to create this sense of fear, this sense of fear. And the Cold War was the perfect place to essentially try to compartmentalize uh, the research that was being done and keep it from the population on the basis of national security or, or, and so forth and so on. And, the, and this Cold War was very important to actually preventing bringing the, the mass of people into the whole idea of what was going on, what could be developed out of this. But it was all, almost always restricted to research. A lot of it was restricted to research in, in, in military areas. Not that military areas don't have applications in civilian areas, but, uh, and, 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 and so forth. And so you have fear. And so rather than educating the population, you actually create a, a feeling of terror in the population. And at the same time that they were doing this, Hollywood came along with, in the 50s with all these science fiction horror movies and going into the 60s. It just inundated my generation. Every time you went to, to the movies, you got, you know, some, some experiment went wrong and you had these big spiders came at you and, and, and you know, and, and so forth and so on. And we, for adults, it's not so bad, but for kids, it's kind of putting a message in their head that, that, that there's these things that could go wrong at any time. Something could go wrong and, 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 and so forth. And that was Hollywood's contribution. And, and um, so, <laughs> however, there was a breakout coming in uh, around around uh, Kennedy and NASA, because they took a military program out of the hands of the military and put it into this, uh, created a space program, and there was a profound, <coughs> there was a momentary profound uh, experience of children my age at the age of nine, ten, eleven when the first astronauts went into space. We were excited, but that was the first, and then the British put out this re Rappaport report about how this was threatening uh, because it was creating a sense of uh, economic, uh, scientific optimism in the population. So, so, so now you have a situation where the population is really not being educated. The educational system got worse in the late 60s and science education was de-emphasized and uh, and liberal arts education was more emphasized, but it was it was it was it was it, there was a massive de-emphasis in it in science education, 
uh, in, the, in the latter part of the 70s. So you ended up having a lot of people who did not have the basic understanding of science that they needed to have to be in the modern world. At the same time, uh, they also buried history. Huh? They also buried history. They, yeah, but at the same time, um, you had you had the this uh, the shroud of of secrecy around this, the defense stuff. And you had a, a general distrust developing between the, po the population that did not have a scientific basis and, the, the, and people involved in science. So there was a disconnect. The scientists were not out organizing the people. The engineers were not out organizing the population. You, didn't have, you, had, a, you had a disconnect between a large portion of the population and those who actually were getting a scientific education and those who were going into science. And so you had a, you had a development of a distrust and, and a, a, a mis an inability to communicate in this, in this situation. So the point that people didn't even bother trying to, uh, trying to communicate to the whole population. I remember this back in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s because we were defending nuclear power and all these engineers and scientists were telling us, you can't go out and educate the population. That's not going to work. I said, well, you have to educate the population. They said, well, you really can't because we really can't. You know, you know, we have to play by their rules. And so they were, they, they didn't really go. The, the scientific community and the engineering community and the corporate community did not really go out on a mass education campaign to educate people about nuclear power and how it really worked. So they never knew. People never knew. In France, the government made a made a point of going to the population and having extensive involvement with the population and explaining how nuclear power works and how it would benefit people and how it actually works. So people actually accepted nuclear power in France. They still do. Why? Because the population became scientifically educated, at least as far as nuclear power went. So this is a key component of the problem that we face today, in that you don't have a scientific uh, literate population. And you have a scientific community that's disconnected from that, and then you have a, and then you have the legacy of the Cold War and all of that, and then in that context, you have what? You have all this other stuff coming in: the climate change, the environmentalism, flat earth. the flat Earth. We never went to the moon. You know, on and on and on and on and on. It's just massive, massive breakdown in the population in terms of any kind of sense of, sci of scientific sense of reality. They just don't have a sense of reality. <coughs> you know, basic reality. I got, I got a better scientific education in high school between 1960, no, in junior high school, excuse me, in junior high school between 1962 <coughs> and 1965 than most people get Today, this is seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Seventh grade, I had chemistry, and eighth grade, I had biology, and I, I forgot what. But anyhow, and then I had to repeat it repeated in, in, in high school. But I got a, I got a better education than anybody can sit I have, I, 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 oh yeah, I got, a, I got a, In the eighth grade, they did a, they did a full, a full thing on where all the, all of the, you know. It was uh, geography, industry, where everything was mined, where everything was. Uh, I had a sense that there was a world out there. There were machines, there were machine tools, all of this in the eighth grade. And then in the ninth grade, and then when I went to high school, it was less than my junior high school. It got worse when I went to high school. And by the time I was in the twelfth grade, which was 1968, 67, 68, it was terrible. They had lost the, the drive. My science teachers, you know, were not really what they were when I was young. So, so this, uh, but without that, where would I be today? Because I didn't take any science courses in college. Well, I took a, a poets astronomy course, but but I didn't take any science courses. So, we'll, but without that early education in science, I would not have a sense of, of reality at all. I mean, I really wouldn't have a sense about where. 
where things come from or, or anything. It's really, uh, this is what's happening. So, so now, uh, now you all remember Mary Beth Shelley's book, Frankenstein. Who do you think they, who she was talking about? Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Electricity. So she's the white. I've never lived the connection. <laughs> so, so does that mean that Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells were against all forms of science? No. They actually promoted an other kind of science. Mind control science. Drugs for mind control. Right? H.G. Wells worked with Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley's brother was Aldous Huxley. Right? They worked on the science of, of psychological brainwashing, the science of mind control, the science of inducing terror in a population and to create personality disorders in people. They worked on those kinds of science. How do you take a person who's relatively mentally healthy and has a positive view of things, and how do you turn them into a psychotic killer? That's the kind of science they, they worked on. That's what Bertrand Russell said. You know, we have to have a science where we can convince children by a certain age that snow is black. And when we've done that, you know, we will have control. That's what they mean by science. What do they mean by science now? They mean being able to clone people so we can get rid of the human race and have robot, have, have cloned individuals. That's how, this is sickness. But that's what they mean by science. They don't mean, they mean biological warfare science. They mean, they mean uh, being able to, um, to monitor everybody. And in the IT, what's the purpose of IT? IT is to control things, not to produce things, but to give you control over things. To give you precise control, to be able to run, run, run derivatives uh, in microseconds. You know, that's what science is for. So all these people, all this artificial intelligence, which is not a bad thing, the working artificial intelligence, it's just that what is it being used for? It's being used, it's, it's being promoted to be, uh, to be used in ways which are not necessarily going to change the world. And how, how, many, how many of the population is really being brought in to participate in, in scientific experiments and so forth and so on. So you, you know I'm building for something. Okay. So now let's look at the 19th Congress of the Communist Party was just concluded. Their vision is for 2050 or 2049, 2050. When, what G means, what President G means by a modern, advanced, prosperous, happy society, what he really means is a completely scientific, literate society. He, he's saying that pulling people out of poverty and giving them the material means of existence does not enough. And the only way that these people can actually be self-governing to have democracy. He wants democracy in 2050. The only reason, the only way that democracy could work is if the people were, the average person were, were scientifically literate, were understand, had a sense of science, had a sense of the real world in that sense, so that they had the reasoning power to, to, to be, to make the intelligence decisions, so that there can be a society where people are not being told what to do every second of the day. You know? And this vision, you have to get the sense of this. They're, they're embarked on a massive scientific literacy campaign in, in, in China right now. And it's only the beginning. They're going to have a generation of engineers coming on board 10 years from now that are we're now 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, and, 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 and they, they are, they will outcompute, out, 
you know, you can forget about having a nuclear war at that ten years from now, because they will have developed the technology, you know, to, to stop your nuclear, you know, to stop it. Most likely. I'm not saying they would. But that's where they're headed. They're heading in that direction. And they want to take the whole world with them. So what happens to a country like Bolivia when they come in contact with the idea of building a railroad from, from uh, you know, from Brazil to Bolivia or, or through Peru? What happens? They have an indigenous president. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, huh? Evo Morales. Evo, Evo Morales. But who was Evo Morales? How did he become the president of Bolivia? Well, he was the leader of the coca growers. He was the leader of the coca growers. And then he comes to power, and he nationalizes the oil companies, which gives the country a certain amount of extra capabilities from the revenues. And what is he talking about? They're talking about a nuclear energy program for Bolivia and a space program for Bolivia. Who the hell would ever thought that some indigenous person would, you know, totally wrapped up in indigenous religions and indigenous cultures and coca consumption and coca growing would ever decide that, hey, you know, we want to go, we want to develop science. We want science for our people. Well, what do you think happens? Happened. That he began to open up and see the, see the world in a different way. The people, the leadership, his, the leadership of his country. And this is going on all over the world right now, under the one under the Belt and Road. What's going on? These all these countries are being are being communicated a sense that they can have a scientifically literate population and a, and a uh, in, in 30, 40 years, they can not only pull out of poverty, but they can have a society of, of scientifically literate people. What does that do to have a, 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 a nation of scientifically literate people? It, it just, it's a different world. And you have to have that if you're going to go in those directions. You have to have the quality of, of understanding of science in the population. You can't just go there and not, not have that. You can't go into a nuclear-based economy or a space program, a space, go into space, or go later on into fusion unless you have a scientifically literate uh, society. So that's where they're going. And, they're not, and they like the idea. And I don't blame them. So, so this is the new paradigm that you're going to see now spread throughout the world. This, I, this conception. And I'm hoping that, that they will take up um, one of our friends' uh, proposals for uh, nuclear power in, in, in all of this. <laughs> I'm hoping, because that's a good shortcut. Uh, but it's not just that. It's, it's, it's a question of, of, of creating a scientifically liter literate population out of a peasant class. That's the issue. And Bertrand Russell and A.C. Wells knew that that was the issue back in the early 1900s. They understood that that was the issue. Just like Friedrich von Hayek understood the issue with the Mont Gates. So, uh, so now, what's going on? Okay, Trump is in Hawaii and on his way to Japan tomorrow. And then he goes... I think he's two days in Japan, and then he goes to South Korea, and then he goes to China for two days, and now he's ex he goes to Vietnam uh, for two days, and then he, he's extended his trip an extra day uh, to spend uh, time in the Philippines to meet not only with Duterte but to uh, attend the Asian uh, the Asian um, East Asian Summit. Yeah, so. So what's going on? <clears throat> the best that I can tell you is that there's going to be an all-out effort to recruit Donald Trump to this orientation of not only the Belt and Road, but th that the United States needs to come work with uh, these with this uh, perspective. 
But it's not just China which is now being brought into this. It's also Japan. It's also South Korea. The tensions between China and South Korea have now dramatically decreased. Um, the South Koreans are saying they, they will halt all TAD missile, further TAD missile deployments, that they will not join a military alliance with the United States and, 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 and Japan, and that they, um, you know, etc. And Japan is warming up to China. There's a lot going on between Japan and China. You have to understand, Abe was, was put in to, uh, some time ago, several years ago, to be, to be the anti-China anchor of, US, of, of, of Obama's policy. And now he's, he's actually moving very much towards China. The same with Vietnam. Vietnam was part of the anchor of the anti-China policy, and their APEC summit is good. The, the, at the APEC summit, the, the keynote address is going to be done by Xi Jinping. So every Asian leader there, everybody from the uh, APEC, is going to hear Xi Jinping, not Obama, or not somebody else. They're going to hear Xi Jinping put this, put this thing together. And in the audience will be Trump and Putin. Okay, so... <laughs> now this is Vietnam. Vietnam has never been that friendly to China. They, they, they are very proud of having defeated the Chinese in the 1200s. <laughs> and again and again in the 60s. And, and, and again and again. Under Mao or under whoever. So, so you have to understand that, 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 that and there was a, there was a, a heated situation of, uh, a, year, a year ago. But now they're bringing Xi Jinping in to do the uh, keynote address at the Asian summit. And also Trump will be personally going to Hanoi after the Asian summit in Danang to meet with the president of Vietnam. So the question is, can, can Trump be recruited to a vision of a shared future for mankind? And that vision is a, a planet of scientifically literate human beings. That's one part of that vision. And Xi Jinping has made that very clear. Now, Trump has 40 companies going over there. Uh, a lot of them are manufacturing firms. This is not a, this is a, this is going to be big time deal making. Okay, but it's not just big time deal making with China, but it's also with South Korea, it's also with Japan, it's also with Vietnam, it's also with the Philippines. All of this, including any sign that Trump is actually going to participate in the shared vision, is going to massively intensify the assault on Trump inside uh, Europe and the United States. And this intensification will cause even more internal chaos inside the United States and Europe. Okay, because uh, because the because it, because when you do something like this, you also create a potential blowback. So you get you get you get the intensified intensified assault, and then you get the blowback. It's a battle. It's a battle is shaping up. And while I don't think Trump has full control of his government yet, nonetheless, there is a fallout and more fallout, and there's going to be more fallout and more fallout. So it's going. To, so it's it's a it's a revolutionary situation in the United States, and we have never. When we have gone outside of these very selected areas, like Seattle, uh, to, to, to the surrounding suburban areas, we have never gotten this, uh, in, uh, uh, we've never gotten this kind of intense response uh, of coming up and wanting to talk to us. And, you know, we have big signs about dumping Mueller and Trump, I mean Mueller and uh, I don't think Mueller are putting him in prison, and people are just flocking to our tables, talking to us, and we're, and uh, we we have never seen this kind of uh, response from the population, because there's a whole layer of the population that's just, and as this Hillary stuff starts to unwind, 
as the Podesta stuff starts to unwind, and the whole British intelligence angle, and who paid for the dossier, and, and all of the stuff is unwinding, you have Mueller escalating. But, he, he, it turns out that his, his uh, indictment of Manafort is very flimsy. And there's going to be challenges in the court around the indictment. So already Mueller, uh, Manafort's lawyers are now moving to, to completely counter what Mueller, I mean, um, Manafort's lawyers are moving to completely counter Mueller and counterattack, saying he either doesn't have jurisdiction or he falsified or, or, or whatever. And so the court, the court surrounding the case of Manafort is now going to be a war zone where all this stuff's going to come out in that case because the, the, the charges were not, one, did he have jurisdiction to make the charges, two, was there um, malfeasance, three, was there, um, um, I forgot the term, when the, when the uh, you know, falsification of evidence and all of this, it's all, it's all, it's going to be one huge battle. Just that little thing, the, the court battle around Manafort. And then you had, uh, yesterday you had something quite spectacular. Uh, uh, the hard-nosed, pragmatic woman, African-American by the name of Donna Brazil, who's famous, who always says on, you know, you got to pay to play. You gotta pay to play. That's the way it works. You gotta pay to play. She's like the Don King of, 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 <laughs> of, of, of politics. <laughs> Don King is the boxing promoter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, this, so she she has been obviously uh, tasked with this thing. She didn't come out on her own. She's not somebody who would ever come out on her own. She's a team player. <laughs> you know. I just don't know what team. What team she's on? <laughs> she's a team player, and she came out uh, basically exposing the fact that Hillary Clinton's, as a candidate, took over the Democratic National Committee and used it to launder millions and millions and millions of dollars by having people write checks to her fund which they were supposed to go to all these state organizations, but it actually didn't. And this is huge. This is, this is legal. This, is, this could go, this could go, uh, this is, this is, these are crimes. This money laundering uh, is a crime. Not only that, but in the, uh, in, the in, in, in the part that we read in the, in, in the part that was excer excerpted, uh, she says to, she talks about getting ready to make the phone call to Bernie Sanders to tell him whether or not, <laughs> whether or not you know, there was a conspiracy to, by the DNC. She, she, she builds up to the thing and she says, uh, we found the cancer. It was Hillary. <laughs> and, but, the, but, we, but we can't. Was it, it, it is, we, 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 it, the patient will survive. It, we can recover. We can recover. Well, why is she saying that? Because, because this whole thing of Obama and Hillary controlling the party, which didn't end with, it didn't end with the election. They controlled and directed the party into this uh, Russia, 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 Russia thing. They directed it into all these, uh, all these operations, and it's, and it's not going well with, the, with the, the voter base, which is a large portion of the voter base, which is Democratic. The Democrats are the majority in terms of uh, registered voters and, and generally, but it's not with a large portion of the Democratic Party, it's not going very well. And they're realizing it. So it's time to, to, uh, to, to kick the cancer out, right? <laughs> so, so this is huge. Get a new old <laughs> You know, so this is huge. <laughs> and I'm sure it's the state organizations which are going crazy against Hillary and Obama at this point. And it is Obama. It's not just Hillary. Uh, so, now, and then there's a whole thing around Uranium One, and it connects up with Canada, it connects up with Mueller, who was FBI director at the time, and then there's all this payola which is going into the uh, Clinton Foundation. 
you know, I think the, I think the Saudis put in a hundred million. I think the Russians put in quite a few million. Um, all these, Ukrainians. Huh? The Ukrainians. Ukrainians put in a lot. And you know, it's just that, that whole Hillary Clinton Foundation. Yeah, we'll, we'll you know you donate to the Clinton Foundation. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care the of it. <laughs> It's a huge foundation yeah. with hundreds of millions of dollars, uh -huh. and I don't think it, I don't think it has any money in it now. I think uh, yeah, but I think the Saudis back? were asking for their money back, but I, <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyhow, so it's supposed to be charitable. So it okay. so the Donna the Donna Brazil thing is really only the tip of the iceberg, and I believe they they picked it, her because she she's the most brutal person that they can find to do this. You know, absolutely no thick skin. <laughs> yeah, thick skin. Uh, so now, as Robbie was mentioning earlier, the the situation uh, uh, will probably be spreading into Canada because it appears that through Canada 2020, the um, the whole apparatus that came in with Trudeau that was built up uh, prior to Trudeau coming in was all worked out and, uh, and, and was all uh, uh, <coughs> homogenized with, with, the, with Obama's advisors <coughs> and Hillary's advisors and so on and so forth. And you have this relationship of Christia Freeland and many other people with this 2020 <coughs> operation and George Soros and so forth. Now, the significance of this is the following. And, uh, <laughs> and is that the, 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 the current federal government of Canada, the current federal leadership of Canada, is dealing with an entity that they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know, they don't know what Trump's going to do. They don't have any predictability on it. So what do they do? So it's causing tremendous angst in, 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 in the Canadian system because they don't they don't know how to deal with Trump. Because he's not it's not clear. It hasn't been clear whether he's going to consolidate. And it hasn't been clear as to why he, what this whole NAFTA thing is going to turn out to be. And what bilateral relations are talking about. And um and so they're, they're, in, they're in somewhat of a quandary right now. And in my sense, I could be wrong, is that Canada is, going, is, is, is about to go into some kind of political limbo uh, of sorts, where you don't, you, don't have, you don't have any, I don't see any coalescence of a, of a clear direction. And you have all these things going on in Canada, like the, like the Pipeline East being canceled, and, and the Kinder Morgan thing, and Site C, and you have all these different provincial squabbles going on, you know, between the various provinces. And you don't really have a unified vision for Canada. Right? And you don't have a, 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 a conception of how Canada is going to work with the United States either. And while that may be driving Canada to, 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 to China, it's, it's not, that's not the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is what is Canada's vision going to be if the rest of the world is developing a vision of the future. And this uh, new uh, Governor General's vision is not the vision that's, that's coming out of, uh, um, out, of, out of Asia. It's not. And so how is Canada going to relate to a vision that is not the that has no similarity to the vision that's being that's being talked about by Trudeau and or by this governor general or by or, or any of the other political layers. Where is where is the so I sense a, a kind of a strange sort of political limbo is going to develop in Canada where where they're going this way and that way and every which way and you know, how do we deal with Trump? How do we deal with the Chinese? How do we deal with all of this? And how do we deal with the British Empire? How do we deal with the monarchy? How do we deal with, you know, with all of this? And so, uh, as, as our um, promo said earlier, uh, Canada has one foot in one place and another foot in another place. And it's not clear how it's all going to get resolved. 